What are you doing these days? Well, I'm representing Tanya Cup in the civil lawsuit against Sean Parsons. Uh, she's a victim of domestic violence, and that's been a cause of mine for many, many, many years, even before the Simpson trial. So I'm, so I'm representing her. Um, mm -hmm. As well, I'm doing other things that are less momentous. I'm writing mystery novels, and I'm, yeah, handling some criminal cases on appeal. Tell me about the Cup case to the extent you can, and why you're interested in it, and why you feel she has a good civil case. Now, we should explain to folks, this is a civil case. It's not, a, your part is not a criminal thing. Right, right. That's a separate deal. That's a separate thing. So, Sean Parsons is currently facing felony counts for um, her, his assault on Tanya Cup, and um, I'm filing a civil lawsuit as a way of ensuring that her, that he does not escape justice, and that she somehow made whole um, because I don't know what's going to happen with the criminal case, although I'm very happy to see that the district attorney took it seriously and has filed felony charges. So uh, we'll see what happens with that. In the meantime, though, just to make sure, uh, we filed a civil lawsuit. A civil lawsuit means you want money. A civil lawsuit means that we look for compensation for her damages. And in her case, the damages are enormous. Mental, physical, emotional trauma to her as well as her special needs child who was present during the assault. Now walk us through this. Who is Robert Sean Parsons? Where is the money in his family? And what did he do? Robert Sean Parsons is, was her boyfriend. They were dating for seven months. He's the son of the founder of GoDaddy. Um, and he, they were seeing each other on a, on a serious basis. It was a monogamous, fairly monogamous relationship. On, on the night in question, um, he got upset that she saw, looked at text messages on his phone. Um, and thus, and assaulted her as a result of that, choked her, um, swung her around a bit. Um, she was hurt badly enough to wind up in the emergency room with injuries that were uh, photographed. She has been since been treated by uh, a team of doctors for neurological damage, hearing loss, uh, nervous tremors. There's been uh, a great deal uh, of medical problems as well as psychological and emotional ones. So her. Uh, her problems are ongoing and the bills are mounting. And do you think that this case is emblematic of a larger problem? Well, yes. I mean, it always is. Domestic violence is a long-standing problem that we've had. And it, the statistics are still uh, very upsetting for, for all that we've seen that we've, we've raised awareness. I mean, this is Domestic Violence Month, right? But still, uh, every four hours, a woman dies at the hands of an intimate partner. And the number of women harmed in spousal abuse, intimate partner abuse, um, they suffer more injuries from that than from rapes, muggings, and car accidents combined, still. So it's, it's, a, it's an ongoing problem of epidemic proportion, and we have to take a stand wherever possible to make it clear that this is a crime, and this is not a family affair, and this is not something that she deserves, that she provoked. There's no such thing as anyone deserving to be hit in a relationship. So. Uh, it's still very important to take a stand whenever possible and raise awareness. You're so passionate about this. Is this a problem that has touched you personally in your life? Fortunately, it has not. So uh, I'm glad to say that I, that's the one thing I probably haven't been through is, is that. But I have friends who have and, you know, and, and relatives who have. And I, I know, of course, and I've prosecuted cases involving the victims of domestic violence. So I've had a lot of experience with it. Paramount, of course, was the Simpson case. Right. I was at Camp OJ. You were? You never saw me. I was one of the, the crowd, people living in that sort of tent city that sprung it up. It was scary. You guys were up on that scaffolding. Wasn't that dangerous? Yeah. Yeah. But it was. Lived, it was crazy. Lived. So every once yeah. in a while, you came out, and you would see all the reporters, I imagine. What did you think as you walked by that scene every day for all those months? It was crazy. You know, I mean, how could, no, there had been no case that was ever like that. I mean, it was a first. And only, actually, I don't know if anything's been quite that crazy since. Although the Michael Jackson trial in Santa Barbara was uh, very heavily covered. And I was one of the people covering it for Entertainment Tonight, so I was on the other side of things then. But it was always a, a, a mind-blowing experience to come out and see. I didn't go out front very much, but when I did, it was ast astonishing. Did you think you would lose that case? Um, really? I have to say, everybody thought we were going to lose that case, kind of from the start, so. Why? 
Are we really going to talk about the Simpson trial here? A little bit. <laughs> you're, you're a pivotal figure in history. <laughs> I mean, yeah. in, in the modern Amer history of American jurisprudence, criminal trials that have been more famous than any other in this country, that's pretty much up there at the top. It really is. I mean, and I was there, so I have a bit of an acute personal interest in it. But it's something that people to this day are talking about, the way it sort of held a mirror up to our society. Yeah. You know, so the many is, issues in it. Right, and, and you were talking about the ongoing problem of domestic violence. This was a case of domestic violence. And when we talk about problems with racial relations in our country, we're looking back 20 years. We've still got the same festering problems that we had 20 years ago. True. So it's sort of a pivot point. So yeah, I think it's a pretty great thing to talk about. To me, just as an observer and as a reporter covering it, to, in many ways that case was over before it started, just mm -hmm. because of the venue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have to say that that's the one thing that I don't know how that got started or why it persists. We never had, there was never a chance of trying the case in Santa Monica. It never was going to go there. The judges wouldn't allow it. All long cause cases with security issues like this one had to be tried downtown where they had the security to handle it. Santa Monica was not only earthquake damage, but people were escaping from there all the time, running to, yeah, it was right on the beach. So it was a, it was a dangerous venue and they can't, a little branch court can get, over, uh, you take over a trial court for a year and a half, they can't handle their caseload that way. But what, so once it wasn't a was criminal never. case, then it was safe enough to have it there. Well, no, because a civil case, they're not worried about it. You know, right, they, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, so they the don't. The second case, the second time around, that's where it was held. Yeah, that's where it was. But, you know, even in that case, he never convinced uh, any, not one single African American. Was it payback for the riots, Rodney King episode? Some say that. I think that in part that's true. I think there's a, there, I think there are a lot of reasons. I think it's a very a much more complex thing than has been acknowledged. I think that some of it comes. I think we've all seen now. Let's talk about today with the police shootings. Um, the the awareness of some of the unfairness in in the way African Americans were treated by law enforcement was something they were more aware of back then than we were, and that, so there was a level of suspicion about anything a police officer said or did. And you cannot help but bring your life experiences to bear in a jury trial. In fact, we're, you're expected to in many ways. Not bias, just life experience. But that's a fine line. So that's part of it. The other part of it, sure. I mean, one juror was overheard saying it's payback time. Out and out said it. Really? Yes. Now, you go to all the time and trouble to put together a case and follow all the rules that courts have mm -hmm. in which the rule of law is more important than personal prejudice or anything else, and yet it all gets derailed. It all gets nullified. What was the point? Uh, you know, in our case, actually, there really was a point because you got to see it. That was the one thing that made me glad the media was there because if you hadn't been there, no one would know what a travesty of justice the verdict was. No one would know. So you were. And so then the country got to see how much evidence there really was you know, what, what the case was really all about. And that's a good thing. It's the only way to fix things, it's, is to see what the problems are. And nevertheless, there will always be cases that go off the rails. Casey Anthony, to me, to me, is a case where, that went off the rails. And I, I don't understand that verdict. I understand the Simpson verdict more than I understand the Casey Anthony right, verdict. Right, how about the George Zimmerman verdict? That, that to me, you know, so people, that's, that one really does come down to I think personal experiences with law enforcement and personal experiences with, um, with African Americans, and they all have different opinions. Standing back as a prosecutor dispassionately, it did look to me like an illegal shooting. Uh, I, I was not convinced um, that he shot in self-defense. What difference does it make now that we've had the advent of smartphones? Um, smartphones obviously have... To me, that makes a world of difference. Don't you think? Don't you think? What if there had been smartphones at the time of OJ? Well, probably wouldn't have mattered because that happened at night and in a, in a closed off little area in front of her condo that wasn't really visible from the street. So it's unlikely that would have made a difference. But, um, but these you things... Think, but it, sometimes you could be surprised. There's someone up on a... Oh, you never know. You never know. I mean, of course, everybody's learning that now. You never know who's watching. Everything's on, on video. You can... I mean, it's almost amazing to see how much has been captured. And, and that, it's, it's like you having you guys having the media in the courtroom. Um, we can't fix it if we can't see it. So. Did you follow the Jody Arias trial? 
Yes. What yes. was your take on that? I thought there was too much media coverage of that. It was. That, that was almost, that, that, that to me veered over into the salacious, you know? It went a little crazy. I was part of it, and to me I felt like I was part of a toxic brew. Yes, yes, yes. This sort of yes. cauldron. Right. And I was right. part of it floating right. around and around. You know, what can you do? That, that's the problem too, though. I mean, you let the media in, and then they're going to do what they do. And, and it can be, and then you have all the cable shows that chew it over on all the talk shows. There's no controlling it. You can't, once you let the cameras in, it's like the camel's nose. Everything can happen. So sometimes it will be tasteful and appropriate. Other times it will not. I was a bit ambivalent about it because sometimes I th thought it went sort of off the rails. But then the other side of it is people do have the right, especially here in Arizona, to, you know, get that window on what's going on in the courtroom. Mm -hmm. And we do provide mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. I think people yeah. learn about the process that way. Yeah, I don't see anything. I, I really don't have an objection to cameras in the courtroom. I think I have an objection to what happens outside the courtroom. I think that if you're going to have media coverage, that's great. Then the lawyers should have, they should impose a gag order. The lawyers should not be allowed to talk outside, nor should anyone associated with those lawyers be allowed to talk for them. And if you control that, um, and you let, you let the media put on camera only what the jurors can see, then you never run the risk of tainting jurors or having uh, lawyers do spin out on the courthouse steps that's uncontrolled. I mean, uh, that's why I think and so if, you do the cameras, if you do cameras in the courtroom correctly, it's, it's a good thing. Everybody learns about the process. Let me return back to the subject of domestic violence, because that's your passion. You were obviously intimately involved with the Simpson trial. How did that shine a light on the problems of domestic violence in this country? The, the trial helped to put the spotlight on people's beliefs and the myths about domestic violence that exist. It, it, it let people really see that a family likes to sweep this kind of thing under the rug. It's very common. Family members who see the woman being abused will, it's a family affair, let them deal with it, or I'm sure she must have done something to provoke him, or, you know, whatever. And they, they, they don't look at it as really a crime. And, and that is a big problem in and of itself, is this kind of minimizing of what domestic violence is. It, it's, a, it's an assault, just like an assault that happens out on the street. The difference is that in a domestic violence situation, he's got access to her 24-7, whereas a stranger, not so much. So I think it, it's thrown a spotlight on a lot of these issues and beliefs that we have that really harm the cause of raising awareness uh, about domestic violence and the seriousness of the problem. What is your message to Robert Sean Parsons? My message to him is you, you've committed a terrible assault against this woman and she deserves to see you brought to justice and she deserves to have her life be healed in any way possible, as much as possible. She will never be, never be entirely healed from this very traumatic incident, but she deserves to get as much as she can on the road to healing in a way that can bring her back mentally, physically, emotionally, and also help her special needs child who has also been harmed, traumatized by this. And what do you make of the life journey of O.J. Simpson in the years since he was acquitted? What can be made of that? I I'm mean, asking you, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, it, it, look, he was, the truth of the matter is, like so many of these star football players, he was entitled and he could do no wrong. And he got away with a lot before he started beating Nicole. And Nicole was far and away not the first woman he assaulted, by no means. And then when he got, um, then when he got uh, acquitted, um, I think it reaffirmed his belief that I'm Teflon and I can do whatever I want. And so he did. And so you have that insane case in Las Vegas where he was on videotape with these two guys with guns uh, getting his stuff back. Just, uh, I think he just continues to perform to type. He's a sociopath. Hmm. You think that uh, it's better now than it was 20 years ago? What or are is? we just revisiting the same domestic violence problems just in a more high-tech fashion? You know, I think it's better now. <coughs> I think that, that people, I think there's more awareness now. The problem I have is that there are still so many women being abused. It's still going on. It hasn't stopped, not by any means. The statistics are still shocking. So although there are more people who understand it's a crime and needs to be prosecuted, needs to be handled seriously, um, 
you still have the cycle of violence that happens as a result of kids who are raised in abusive homes and learn that as a method of having intimate relations. They don't, it, it just perpetuates the cycle and that's what needs to stop. How disturbed were you that Ray Rice's wife, after there's video of him throwing her against the wall in the elevator, defended him, stood by her man? Yeah, it's always unfortunate to me that women back away from these charges. That was a very serious attack. Um, it's obviously not unusual that this happens. And in the case of someone who's very powerful and, and famous like him, there's a lot of pressure on her to back down and step away and let it be and let it, let it go away. So, you know, I, I don't blame her, but it is disappointing when that happens. I understand it, but it's disappointing. And if there's a woman who's caught in an abusive relationship, who feels that she's in a corner, she can't get out, fears for her life, what, you know, maybe doesn't have money and access to right. fine lawyers, what can they do? Right. They, they, often these women find themselves in a lose-lose proposition. They can't afford to live on their own, and so they, they have to stay in the house with the abuser. That's why there are battered women's shelters. And that the more we can, um, in any community, empower those shelters with donations and help and uh, whoever can offer services, that, that's the only recourse that they have and, so, and the only thing that can save their lives. Now, is there anything you want to talk about that somehow I have not asked you? I know. I can't imagine it. <laughs> I thought this was going to be a quick five-minute thing. <laughs> Little did you know. Little did I know. <laughs> well, it's really, really nice to make your acquaintance. Nice Thanks to meet so you, much too. What a pleasure. Thank you for taking the time Thank and coming here to me. talk to us. Appreciate it.